you've had a glimpse of the excitement of uh, what it's like for us actually to peer into the human brain. Um, and MRI has absolutely revolutionized uh, our understanding of the disease and has helped us to get us where we are today, which is the subject of the next talk. Uh, we really would not have the therapies that we have today and the therapies that are um, imminent that Dr. Loveland's going to talk about um, late this afternoon without, without MRI. Um, our, our next speaker gets no introduction, because it's me. If you want to read about me at all, there's a little bio inside. Um, so I have the exciting opportunity to talk about where we are in, in treatment today and how we go about making a decision from the um, now seven um, therapies that we have on the market uh, to modify the course of the disease. But I have enough gray hair to be able to remember um, back prior to 1993 when we had absolutely no treatments that impact uh, multiple sclerosis. And the palpable excitement that we experienced in 1993 when the first of those therapies, beta seron, was introduced to the market. But when one uh, wants to talk about treatment, we actually can talk about that uh, in three rubrics. One is the treatment of acute attacks, also known as relapses or exacerbations. The second and the major subject of my talk, um, disease-modifying therapies, those agents which will alter the natural course of multiple sclerosis. And finally, the very important topic of symptomatic treatment. Um, these are treatments that can improve the qualities of life immeasurably by relieving specific symptoms. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about that today. It could be the subject of a whole other talk, but I don't want to de-emphasize its importance. So what do we do when people have acute attacks? So the mainstay of the treatment for acute attacks is the use of corticosteroids. These are steroids that that impact inflammation, as Dr. Fabian said. These are not the bad steroids that athletes take. They're not gonna make you um, be bodybuilders. They're not gonna send you up before Congress. Um, these are a kind of steroids that reduce inflammation. And what we primarily use is high-dose intravenous steroids, known as intravenous methylprednisolone. Different physicians will administer uh, courses of steroids for different lengths of time, typically for three to five days. We don't have any hard evidence that tells us what's the precise duration with which we should use the steroids. In the old days, people usually were brought into the hospital to get steroids, but the good news now is it's very uncommon that we actually admit a patient for steroids. We can administer them in our own infu infusion center or often we can arrange for, um, for nurses and home infusion services to come to the house to administer steroids. We don't like to do that the first time anyone has received steroids because there can sometimes be side effects from the steroids and we want to know that somebody tolerates that kind of treatment uh, well. Uh, some physicians will commonly follow the administration of the three or five or sometimes seven days of high dose steroids with a short course of oral steroids, usually a medicine known as prednisone, um, for a couple of weeks. But there isn't any evidence that says that people do any better if they get that short taper or whether one just goes cold turkey and stops the uh, course of steroids after the intravenous methylprednisolone. So um, there's neither a right or wrong to using the oral taper. However, there is some evidence that giving moderate doses of oral corticosteroids by themselves, which used to be a relatively common practice, I'm talking about, for instance, using prednisone in 60 to 80 milligrams a day to start, as opposed to the high-dose intravenous methylprednisolone, typically about 1,000 milligrams that we commonly give, because there is evidence from a clinical trial looking at one particular type of attack, optic neuritis, that suggested that patients who received oral corticosteroids might be more likely to relapse in the near future than they were if they got intravenous methylprednisolone in high dose or even if they got just placebo, dummy medication. 
Now, not every patient who has an acute attack, in our view, needs a course of corticosteroids. I generally recommend that steroids be used when a patient has an attack that's severe enough to interfere with function or is making a person extremely uncomfortable. If a person has an attack, for example, that's manifest by some relatively minor numbness or tingling that's simply an annoyance, I will suggest that we not use steroids, because although steroids are very safe, there are occasional significant side effects. Many patients who get a course of steroids will experience rapid recovery, rapid improvement, even while the steroids are being administered. In other cases, the, re the improvement or recovery is delayed for days or weeks after the conclusion of steroids. And unfortunately, in some patients there, uh, with some attacks, there isn't a very good response. The best evidence of what steroids do, and the reason why we don't leave patients on steroids or try to use them too frequently, is that it doesn't appear that steroids alter the extent to which an individual will recover from a particular attack, but rather that the steroids will act to hasten whatever recovery was destined to occur. So you get better, you get better faster, but you don't get more better than you would if you got steroids. Now, for some patients who don't respond adequately to a course of steroids, there is an alternative therapy that fortunately we don't uh, have to do on a very frequent basis, but it can be helpful if a person has had a severe attack that has not responded well to steroids. And that's a procedure known as plasmapheresis or plasma exchange, in which an, individual, an individual's blood is removed, the, um, the, the cellular elements are returned, and uh, the plasma is removed and replaced by an alternate fluid. So in essence, you're removing bad things from the plasma, which seems to hasten their recovery in perhaps about half of the patients. All right, I'm going to spend the rest of the time on treatments known as disease-modifying therapies. Um, and I'm going to address the issues of why do we treat with these drugs, when do we treat, and whom do we treat? And the main reason that we treat is because these drugs alter the prognosis. Many of you will remember George Burns who said, I look to the future because that's where I'm going to spend the rest of my life. And we believe that these treatments will all enable people with MS to spend the rest of their lives in a better place. And it does, these drugs do this by preventing relapses, by reducing the likelihood of progressive disability, and by decreasing the extent of disease that's evident on MRI. And as uh, Dr. Fabian first and Dr. Inglesi later emphasized, uh, many lesions uh, on the MRI are not necessarily symptomatic. Nonetheless, we believe that the continual accumulation of MRI lesions and the development of brain atrophy are not likely to be a good thing in the long term. So impacting the MRI gives us a clue that we're, that we're making um, positive inroads in the individual's course. Um, Dr. Fabian also showed you another version of this slide, which are the respective courses of MS. So I want to indicate when we treat patients. So Whoops, sorry. So this is the most typical course. 80 to 85 percent of people with MS begin with relapsing remitting disease. And at this very first relapse, before one is able to make a diagnosis of MS because you need disease activity at multiple points in time to make the diagnosis, we call this the clinically isolated syndrome. And that's the first point at which we are likely to recommend that a person begin treatment. And the reason for that is that studies have shown that um, when you do that, you reduce the frequency of conversion to definite MS. So this was one study with beta seron, but the same study has been done with all of the injectable um, MS drugs which shows that there's a considerable reduction in the conversion to definite MS over the next couple of years. If you start the treatment 
even at the point in time when you're not entitled to say that a person has definite MS. But we know that a person with a first episode who has lesions on MRI is almost certainly destined ultimately to be diagnosed with MS. There's also a suggest suggestive evidence now that starting these treatments at that very early stage will delay the likelihood and the extent of progressive disability. Every patient who has entered the actual stage of relapsing remitting MS is recommended to consider going on therapy, and we do that as early as possible in the course. Now, at the present time, all of the therapies that we have as disease-modifying agents are indicated for the purpose of reducing relapses. So any form of relapsing disease, be it relapsing remitting disease, or be it secondary progressive disease in those patients who are still having relapses, which is a significant percentage, but not all. Some stop having relapses. But if you're continuing to have relapses, these drugs are appropriate choices of treatment. Unfortunately, at the moment, we don't have any treatments that have been clearly proved to be beneficial in treating patients who have purely progressive disease with no relapses, either secondary progressive or primary progressive disease. The very exciting news is, however, that um, there are currently a couple of active trials of very promising agents for primary progressive um, disease, one with a drug that's an oral drug that's on the market that I'll be talking about in a moment for relapsing disease, and another um, intravenously administered drug that's very promising. And in, in addition, um, Tysabri, one of our most, uh, perhaps our most effective drug for relapsing remitting disease, has just begun a trial in secondary progressive disease. I'm happy to say that at the Dickinson Center, we um, are participating in all of those trials. Well, this, in order of approval, is the list of currently available drugs, seven drugs from zero to seven in 18 years. Quite a remarkable accomplishment. And MS, in fact, has been probably the most active area of neurological therapeutics, and perhaps the most active area of drug development in all of medicine over less than the past two decades. So four of these agents are injectable agents, the first four on the list. Three of them are interferons, beta seron, Avonex, and Rebif. They differ slightly from one another, and they differ in their route and frequency of administration. And then the, the one non-interferon, copaxone or glutyramer acetate. In addition, we have novantrone or mitoxantrone, which is an agent that actually is approved for secondary progressive MS, although whether it actually works for those patients with insidiously worsening disease is unclear. Mitoxantrone has some very significant and serious side effects, and it's very little used today in the United States, and I'm not going to talk further about it. And then finally, the newer agents that I will talk about at some length, uh, Tysabri and Gelenia. So although we have traditionally said that 50% of or more of patients will progress to the point of needing an aid to walk within 20 years, it's exciting to say, as Yogi Berra said, the future ain't what it used to be. And clearly, we're making changes in the natural history of the disease with the available agents that we have. And I expect that we will make even more dramatic progress as time goes on with the exciting drugs that Dr. Loveland will talk about this afternoon. Well, how do we go about actually deciding on what drug to use in a particular patient? At the Dickinson Center, we don't believe that one flavor fits all. It's not all vanilla or chocolate. And we believe in a shared decision-making mo model. So we regard our job, uh, in part at least, as that of educating our patients about what is available. There are no free rides in medicine. Everything has a price in terms of side effects, inconvenience, and certainly uh, cost. Um, so a dialogue will ensue uh, 
with my patient and me, and together we'll try to hit upon the drug that seems to be the best fit at that particular time for a particular patient. And some of my colleagues have said that MS should be regarded as a marathon, not a sprint. So what we're trying to do is find a drug that a patient will be comfortable taking and that hopefully will work for a long period of time. That inevitably requires, in part, balancing the benefits of a potential drug with the risks that that drug entails. And there's a complicated process in trying to reach a decision about which particular drug to, to choose for a particular patient. Safety is always paramount in our minds. The degree of response is critically important. We always want to base our decisions about using treatment on the best available scientifically developed evidence, not myths. But we respect the fact that it's difficult for people to take some of these medicines, especially perhaps the injectable medicines. They're uncomfortable. Uh, so tolerability and convenience for a given patient go, are important things that go into the um, decision-making process. To what extent is monitoring going to be required? Is this a woman who's contemplating a pregnancy in the near term, which may influence significantly the choice of medication or, in fact, whether to be on medication again uh, at all? And, of course, cost unfortunately, sometimes looms in the equation. Now, this thing up here that says MOA, that refers to mechanism of action. How does a particular medicine work? Well, from my point of view, it really doesn't matter how the medicine works in terms of what I'm going to choose to use. But it is helpful in understanding how a medicine works and might sometimes have an influence in tailoring the choice. And it always makes for a good story and a high comfort level when we, when we have a logic for why a particular medicine works. So in the next few minutes, um, thanks in part to uh, my colleague, Dr. Krieger, whose slide I stole, um, we're going to talk about uh, the simplified version of the immune response in multiple sclerosis. Because all of the medicines that we use are medicines that impact the immune system. So many of you in this room, I suspect maybe almost all of you, probably think that multiple sclerosis is primarily a disease of the central nervous system. But it's probably not primarily a disease of the central nervous system. The disease starts, as Dr. Fabian said, out here in the blood. So in the blood, immune cells, these um, light blue things here called a TH0 cell, is a particular undifferentiated lymphocyte. And that lymphocyte is going to encounter an antigen, a protein. It might be a foreign protein, like a virus. And because that foreign protein may have some similarity to proteins within the central nervous system, these cells get programmed once they get in the brain and spinal cord to do damage, to, to attack those um, self-proteins, the things actually that belong there, perhaps mistakenly thinking they're trying to get rid of something bad. Well, these uh, undifferentiated T lymphocytes get differentiated potentially into bad guys called Th1 cells. These are a kind of lymphocyte that you can regard as pro-inflammatory. They promote inflammation within the central nervous system. The next thing that has to happen is that this pink broken up vertical line here represents what's known as the blood-brain barrier. <clears throat> it's something that consists, that exists to keep bad things out of the brain and spinal cord. These uh, activated lymphocytes, however, breach the blood-brain barrier. They get into the brain or spinal cord. They again see their antigen and proliferate. 
releasing a series of bad chemicals, which in turn damage the myelin sheath and perhaps the nerve fiber itself. So that's a simplified version of what we think is happening to damage the central nervous system. All of the drugs that we have available, as well as all of the drugs that are about to become available, impact this scheme in one way or another. So this is interferon beta, also, uh, and we have three preparations of this, beta, seron, avonex, and rebif. And these drugs work in several different ways. They probably um, impact the presentation of antigen to the lymphocytes. That probably decreases the likelihood of the promotion of activated T cells. And the interferons also tend to stabilize the blood-brain barrier in a way to make it less likely that those damaging T cells, which do arise, can cross into the brain. And thereby, they lessen the inflammatory process within the brain. So the interferons, again, Abinex, beta seron, and rebif, which differ somewhat in how often they're given and how they're given. Um, Abinex is administered intramuscularly once a week. Beta seron and rebif are administered subcutaneously, a small needle under the skin, um, and they're given several times a week. These agents are moderately effective. They reduce the relapse rate by about 30 to 35 percent, but they're associated with a number of unpleasant side effects, as many of you in the room who've taken them undoubtedly know. At the beginning of therapy in particular, they're associated with flu-like symptoms, uh, muscle aches, uh, joint pain, low-grade fever, chills, headache, fatigue, and a general sense of the blahs on the day following the injection. Those symptoms tend to improve over time um, and often go away completely, particularly with the multiply dosed interferons. There sometimes are mood changes in people who take interferons. Occasionally, we need to treat with, in, with antidepressants or even less frequently to stop that medication. And there are some usually, generally minor local injection site reject, uh, reactions. It is important that we monitor blood counts and liver enzymes in people who take interferons because occasionally there are abnormalities. They're not dangerous. It means we hold the drug or sometimes change the dose. And some patients who, who take um, interferons over time develop what are called neutralizing antibodies. Uh, these uh, interferons are proteins. When proteins are injected, the body makes antibodies. One form of antibody is called neutralizing antibodies. They're not dangerous, but if they develop to a high level, it means the medication will likely no longer work. So that is a potential issue in a minority of patients who take interferon. Let's turn to Copaxone and look at how its mechanism of action is. In this case, what Copaxone does is turns those uh, Th0 cells, the undifferentiated T cells, rather in, than into the pro-inflammatory Th1 cells, into an anti-inflammatory Th2 cell. So it changes the predominance of the um, cell balance in favor of negating inflammation. And so these Th2 cells now are activated, traffic into the central nervous system, and they release good chemicals, which in turn suppress, by what's known as a bystander effect, other active cells and turn down the inflammatory response within the brain. Copaxone like the interferons, is moderately effective. And recent studies looking at head-to-head -head trials between Copaxone and a couple of different interferons have shown that these drugs are essentially equally effective. The side effects of uh, Copaxone are different from the interferons. They don't produce any of the flu-like symptoms. They don't produce mood changes. 
The main problem with Copaxone is local injection site irritation, typically itching or burning at the injection site, sometimes a red welt. Um, people need to know that after, uh, rarely after a, a Copaxone injection, one might get uh, what's known as a post-injection systemic reaction that consists of tightness in the chest, flushing of the face, it might be associated with palpitations, shortness of breath, a feeling of anxiety. Comes on right after a shot, lasts 10 to 20 minutes. It's never been serious. It's not a cardiac event. We don't know why it happens, and it happens very infrequently. But some people who've not been warned about it have run off to the emergency department thinking something bad is happening. It's usually gone away by the time they get there. One other issue that does plague some patients with, who take Copaxone is that after they've taken it for a long period of time, and this seems to happen more in women than in men, they develop a loss of fatty tissue under the injection sites. This can result in unpleasant divots in the thigh or the upper arms or the abdomen where the injections are given and is a, is a nuisance with the long-term use of this. Drug. We don't know how to uh, prevent it except by using as many injection sites as possible. The good news about Copaxone is there's no need for blood tests and there are no neutralizing antibodies. So these have been the mainstay of therapy over the last nearly two decades, these four injectable drugs. Do any of you have cats? Well, we have a couple of cats at home and we do not like to find ourselves in, in this position. Gentleman is saying to the cat, never ever think outside the box. But fortunately for MS therapeutics, some people did think outside the box and got away from the focus on interferons and copaxone. Looking at novel mechanisms of action, new routes of administration of drugs, and different types of agents. One of these agents is known as Tysabri. Now, um, we've, uh, I've shown you a few moments ago this uh, paradigm of the immune response, but remember that in order to do any damage, these immune cells have to actually get into the central nervous system. They don't do any harm to the brain or the spinal cord while they're streaming through the blood. One of the things that has to happen in order for a cell to get into the brain or spinal cord is that it has to halt, it has to stop up against the wall of the blood vessel. So this is the blood vessel, these are the cells that line the blood vessel, and this is the brain. So a cell has to actually be halted or arrested against the blood vessel wall in order to get into the brain or spinal cord. And one of the ways these cells do that is they have molecules on their surface that are known as adhesion molecules. And the adhesion molecule on the surface needs to interact with a complementary receptor molecule on the blood vessel wall. So this is like a lock and a key mechanism. We have a number of different molecules on the surface of cells, but one particular one is called VLA4, and it interacts with a receptor molecule called VCAM1. And what Tysabri is, the new agent that was introduced, is a, an antibody that's directed against VLA4. So it blocks this interaction, and thereby this cell cannot be arrested against the blood vessel wall and cannot get into the brain or spinal cord to do damage. Now, Tysabri is arguably our most effective therapy for relapsing MS. You'll remember that the interferons and copaxone reduce the annualized relapse rate by about 30 to 35 percent compared to placebo in their own respective trials. Tysabri reduced the relapse rate by 68 percent compared to placebo in its trial. Now, that looks dramatically different, but a word of caution there, it's not kosher to compare drugs across trials. You actually only know for certainty that one drug is more effective than another 
if you compare them within the same trial. And I'll show you, uh, I'll come back to that point a little bit later again. But that's not been done with Tysabri. So although this number looks much bigger, it isn't absolutely proved that this is a more effective agent than the injectable drugs. Well, Tysabri was originally introduced to the market in 2004. Um, it's given by intravenous infusion every four weeks, uh, no injections in between. And it looked like an exciting addition. But four months later, the drug was taken off the market in February 2005. But it, because a couple of cases of a rare but extremely serious brain infection known as PML was, were discovered um, among patients who had been in one of the clinical trials. That brain infection is, call, is caused by a virus called JC virus. Um, the drug was removed from the market for about 16 months and then reintroduced uh, to the market in July 2006 with some precautions to try to minimize the risk of an individual's developing PML. Now, JC virus is a, a fairly ubiquitous virus, and more than 50% of you are probably living with this virus, just as we live with many other viruses and our lives go on happily ever after. It never causes any trouble, except in people who have something different or changed about their immune system. Um, other than the risk of this brain infection, which I'll return to, the drug is very well tolerated. It causes an occasional allergic reaction. And it has the uh, relative inconvenience that a person has to take three hours out of their life every four weeks to go to an infusion center, but the good news is that in between times, they don't have to take any injections. Now, we always emphasize safety first in choosing a drug. And when Tysabri was reintroduced to the market in July 06, we reserved the use of that agent for patients who were not doing well enough on the interferons or copaxone, or for some reason were not able to tolerate those drugs. In those circumstances, it seemed worthwhile to accept the risk, the very small risk of this serious brain infection. But we reserved the drug in those days for those patients. However, in the past year or two, we've been learning a lot about what determines the risk for the development of PML, which is changing the way that we use Tysabri. We now have uh, the availability of an assay that looks for the presence of antibody to JC virus. And if you have antibody, that means you, ha you are infected with the virus. And as I said, roughly 50% of the population, a little bit less in younger people, have the antibody and hence have the virus. So far, it looks as if one has to already have the virus in order to be able to develop PML in the context of taking Tysabri. And so this slide, which was made up a little while ago, at a point when 23 patients who had developed PML for whom blood was available prior to the administration of Tysabri, all of them were positive. There were no negative um, antibody cases who developed PML. And what this slide presumes is that if the, if the very next person who developed PML was in fact antibody negative, that would translate to mean that the risk for PML in a patient taking Tysabri who was negative is 1 in 10,000. Now we have over 40 patients who are all antibody negative, so the risk is estimated at 1 in 20,000 or less, which makes it a reasonable option to consider Tysabri perhaps even as a first-line therapy. In addition, we, we know that patients who have previously used immunosuppressive drugs, drugs that suppress the immune system, that greatly increases your risk. So if you look down here, for example, and the risk of, of PML is also uh, duration dependent. So there are virtually no patients with PML with less than a year of therapy, and it goes up at, at around two years. So people who have had um, no prior immunotherapy, 
immunosuppressive therapy, but I've been on Tysabri for two years or more, 2.8 out of 1,000, roughly one in 350 people, will develop PML. But if you've been previously immunosuppressed, it falls to one in 125. So we're learning how to stratify the risk and understand the risk and choose more carefully who should go on Tysabri. Let me turn now to the one oral drug that's now the first oral agent on the market, and that's known as Gelenia. Gelenia acts to put your lymphocytes in jail and thereby keep them out of the brain or central nervous system. On the surface of lymphocytes are molecules called S1P receptors. Most of our lymphocytes are in lymph nodes, not in the bloodstream. In order to get out of the lymph node, this S1P receptor has to be activated. And what Gelenia does is it modulates, it changes this S1P receptor so that it can't interact properly and the cell can't get out of the lymph node. So if it can't get out of the lymph node, it can't get into the brain and the spinal cord to do damage. This uh, mechanism doesn't affect certain circulating memory lymphocytes in the blood that we need to fight infections with agents that we've already seen. So this drug is moderately to highly effective. It reduces the relapse rate by about 55%. <clears throat> there are some side effects which necessitate a, uh, an evaluation prior to initiation of the therapy that you can read here, and we need to check uh, ophthalmologic status because the drug sometimes causes a condition known as macular edema. We need to do these other baseline precautions before a patient goes on therapy. The main concern with Gelenia is its relative newness. It's only been on the market for a year and there are relatively small numbers of patients on this drug. And because of the way the drug works, there is the potential and I emphasize it's a potential because it has not yet been reported, that unusual and potentially serious infections, just as we have seen PML with Tysabri, could occur. So most uh, of us at the um, uh, CGD Center and many of my colleagues around the world are quite cautious about using Gelenia while we await further information. The drug also, when it's given for the first time, can slow the heart rate um, usually to a trivial extent, but it does require monitoring at the center. Just to emphasize the point I made about um, not comparing across trials, on the left-hand portion of this curve are the results of the relapse rates with the um, injectable drugs that were obtained back in the 90s. When we saw um, relapse rates up close to, close to one, 0.67 up to 0.87 or so. In the 2000s, suddenly the relapse rates that were obtained even using the same drugs, glatiram or copaxone and the interferons, were now down in the, the 0.3 to 0.4 range. <clears throat> well, clearly the drugs didn't get better. What must have been changing was the, the kinds of patients that were going into the trials. And that's why it's important to examine head-to-head um, -head data. And we do have that with Gelenia. And even though uh, this trial, one of the trials with Gelenia was a trial called the TRANSFORMS trial, in which Gelenia was compared to Avonex. And even though Avonex was quite effective in that trial, produced a relapse rate annually of only 0.33, way better than we saw with these drugs in the 90s, Gelenia reduced that relapse rate by more than 50% more to 0.18. So even when the relapse rate is low, you can see the effectiveness of a drug. Let me end up here by, uh, well, first let me say that we'd like to get to the point where three out of four doctors would agree on a particular therapy. Not quite there yet, but it's a dialogue. And just uh, to emphasize what my colleagues have said earlier about vitamin D, because we will commonly recommend that patients go on vitamin D, but we emphasize to each patient that that's not because we know that this drug is going to be beneficial in MS. We have only circumstantial evidence linking it by association 
not necessarily by causation, to MS. And we don't yet have the results of any studies, but some are ongoing that will answer the question of whether if we administer additional vitamin D, will we positively impact the course of MS. Nonetheless, we know that vitamin D in moderate doses can help with bone health and other health issues, and it appears to be safe, so we do recommend it. So as I think you can see and agree, we have many, many exciting ways to help MS patients at the present time. We have many more to come. Stay, stay tuned for this afternoon. Uh, and if all else helps, there's always the couch. So thank you very much for your attention.